Chef won. <laughs> you know, I was thinking as I came up, SpaceX is the leader now in rockets, and we've got it beat because we have a red, white, and blue rocket. And in SpaceX, if you remember when they launched a big one, they had a uh, Tesla on top, and we even topped the Tesla. We have a cross up there. So thank you uh, to Josh and Miliana and Edward and the family for putting that together. And smoke comes out of the bottom. So if you want to come and watch that, I was also told that if um, I was also told that if I go long today, he may turn that on. So we'll see. I may be having some problems with the microphone this morning, but if we do, we will take care of that. Hey, I hope you've had a great week. A couple things real quick, as I've decided after this week, as we finish up Colossians, and I just want to tell you a little bit about why we went to Colossians. We were in Romans, and I had talked about going straight into a study of King David and trying to figure out, you know, how we were going to make that change. Would we have a couple of weeks in between? Would we go straight to King David? And then as I started reading more and more 1 Samuel, I thought we need to expand the study of King David a little bit more. And uh, Colossians kept coming to mind. I was reading Colossians at the time, and I felt like we were being led to go to Colossians, so we decided... Uh, to go to Colossians, and then after Colossians, I've decided now, instead of studying David, we're going to study David, part of First and Second Samuel. So here's what I want to ask you. If you are serious about Bible study, start reading the book of First Samuel, especially the message about Hannah. We're going to talk about Hannah next week. But we're going to walk through First and Second Samuel. It's not going to be as intense like Colossians was, but... What we're going to focus on is we are going to focus on individuals in these scriptures. So the first one will be Hannah. We're going to talk about her resiliency. We will be able to learn something from all these individuals in, the, in First and Second Samuel throughout our study. Here's the other thing. Sometimes people say, well, I don't want to invite someone yet because we're right in the middle of a study. That's not going to fly with this study, and I'll tell you why. Because each week we're going to study a new person or we're going to study some principle that we can use in our life. So it'll talk to anyone. It should be a great study as we study Hannah, we study Eli, we study Hophni and Phineas, his children, and their evilness and what happened as a result of that. We're going to study Samuel and the greatness that is Samuel and what he brought to even our lives lives today. Then we'll move on to King Saul and we'll learn about Saul and how he faltered as a king and how we shouldn't falter in our lives. Then we're going to talk about David, the greatest king the world has ever known, the king that said that he is a man after God's own heart. And guess what? He was a sinner just like us and did some horrible sins. But just a little foreshadowing, the thing I love about David is that every time he sinned and it was brought forth to him, he immediately asked for repentance. And then we're going to talk about the Davidic covenant. Because what has Paul told us? It all goes back to the cross of Jesus. We're going to talk about that next week, beginning next week. So bring your notepads, be studied up, invite people. And I hope you'll be here for what we hope is a robust study over the next few months as we really dig into First and Second Samuel. Okay, today we're going to end our study of Colossians. We've been walking through Colossians. Let me just get you up to speed on this very short book of the Bible, but a very important book of the Bible. Paul, if you remember from Colossians 1, we talked about this. Paul is in prison. He is sitting there, and Epaphras comes to see him in prison. Now, Epaphras was the leader of the Colossian church, and it is believed by scholars that Epaphras was converted by Paul and was mentored by Paul and started this church. Now, he's going back to see Paul as Paul is in prison to tell him an update on the church, but I think his main purpose is to say, hey, Paul, what am I supposed to do with all this heresy? All the heresy in the church is taking people's eyes off of Christ. They're saying that Christ isn't enough to get to heaven. So he, he goes to Paul, his mentor for advice, and Paul sends a letter to the Colossian church. Now remember, the people in uh, the Colossian church didn't really know Paul. Uh, they probably knew who he was, but he didn't start that church. Someone else started that church, but he was concerned about a heresy leading them astray from the teachings of Jesus. And so Paul writes this letter, and he does a couple things early on that I think we can learn from. One, he shows his authority by making sure that he tells the people that he is an apostle of Christ Jesus. 
Now, there's a lot of people who call themselves apostles today, but when he says, I'm an apostle of Christ Jesus, he was specifically chosen, like the disciples, he was specifically chosen by Jesus. You remember he wrote to Damascus, there he is. And so Paul is telling the story. He is an apostle of Christ. So who better to offer them advice than an apostle of Christ? So Paul goes to them, he writes this letter, and he, he sets his his uh, background, kind of his resume at the beginning to get their attention. And then he does something that's pretty interesting. Instead of going straight to what they're doing wrong, and how many of us want to do that sometimes when we're irritated with someone or we think they're going a different way in life, we go straight to what's wrong. But Paul showed wisdom. He started talking to the Colossian church and telling them all that they were doing right. He talked about their prayer, their, the fruit of their faith, all these wonderful things that were going on. And we talked about at that time that even though the Colossian church was starting to listen to heresy, and we drew a comparison to America today with all the heresy that we're being bombarded with, there was so much heresy at the time, we don't know all the heresy that was being addressed. We know some, and I'll talk about that in a moment. But Paul continues to point to the cross of Christ in all this. But he starts off by giving them a, a, an attaboy, so to speak. Good job, way to do this. But we talked about, in comparison to the Colossian church in America today, we look at the Colossian church as failing in many ways, but in reality, the Colossian church was probably in better shape than the American church today. Probably is not dealing with a heresy in the church like, like they were then. They were just starting to get this. I will tell you that heresy is fully grown in our churches across America today. So we have to be careful about what we listen and how do we careful we go back to the Word of God for our direction. We don't let the world define the Word of God. We let the Word of God and His apostles define the Word of God. And that's what Paul is doing. And so he takes on in his writings all those things, the Gnostics, the Jewish traditions, uh, the past pagan practices, and he just hits those head on using the Word of God. And who better to do that than apostle of Christ Jesus. And then as we move into chapter three, and we've spent three weeks talking about two basic verses in, in chapter three. Verse five, all those things we're supposed to run from. In verse 12, those things we're supposed to run to. So we're supposed to abstain from those things in verse five. We're supposed to run to those things in verse 12. And we call these expectations of a Christian. And I said to you that it's the most difficult preaching in many cases because it's so alive in our world today, especially verse five. And the reason being is what Paul is saying, any relationship, any relationship outside of the scope of marriage is wrong. And he lays it out pretty clearly in verse 5 of chapter 3, that marriage is holy. He's bringing back everything from back to Genesis in, and any type of relationship outside of what God ordained in Genesis between one man and one woman is wrong. And we talked about all the things we're hearing in the world today and the heresy that it is when you compare it to what God said about marriage. We'll talk more about marriage here in a moment. And then it talks in 12 about all those things that we're supposed to run to, and we talked about those in depth on how we're supposed to be humble and we're supposed to love people. And we talked about the world may think that's weak, but there's great fortitude in that because you are at that point emulating the life of Jesus Christ. What an important part of our life when we realize that everything we're asked to do, abstaining from things and running towards, Jesus already showed us the way to do all of that. So, I think the reason that God has led us to Colossians is He's asking us and demanding of us, if we're going to take on the mantle of a Christian, if we're going to take on the title of a Christian, we're supposed to be living as a Christian. He's calling us as individuals, He's calling us as a church to live at a higher level in our Christianity to really understand our expectations. And the only way we can understand our expectations, and we've said it here in church, is to really understand the expectations of Christ and to have doors open to us for future service is those three S's we talk about all the time. We need to serve because the Bible tells us. We need to study our scriptures because that's the word of God that's been given us to help us live our life. And we need to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
That's the three things we're called to do. If we do that, we're running towards holiness. We're getting away from those things that he's told us to get away from. And we focus solely on Jesus. Can you imagine how different our lives would be, how different our world would be if people were focused on Jesus instead of their own comfort or whatever they think is right? So Paul is really not only teaching, but he gets into our business and makes us think about the things that we need to be doing as Christians. And then I ended with some questions that I, quite frankly, did not have in my sermon last week, but I felt that I needed to ask these questions. I, one that I asked was, why is the Holy Spirit in these last few weeks leaning on us so hard as individuals in the church? Why has it been so difficult to preach these things? Why has it been so difficult for some of you that have come to talk to me about some of the things that's happened in your life? Why is, why is God leading us? Because there's a purpose in everything. And I think once again, he's leading us to a greater understanding and greater level of being a Christian. You know, why has God continued to challenge us and challenge us even today with Paul's words? What is the purpose of the study of the book of Colossians for you and your life? What is the study? What's the purpose of this study for this church? Because this wasn't what we originally intended to do. But one thing that I think it's very clear that in our study and in our time looking through Colossians, that God's word should be life altering. That God's word should govern our conduct and how we act as individuals. Why? Because we have taken on the name of Jesus Christ as a Christian, and we're supposed to live a life with those expectations of living a life as a Christian. Doesn't mean we're perfect, but when people see us, they see Christ in our lives. It's a tough lesson. Which brings me to the end of the book of Colossians. We're going to wrap it up today. Before I begin with this, let me remind you, as we said last week, this is important to put it in context, that Jesus himself humbled himself, submitted for us to death, submitted to, for us to death so that we could have salvation. Humbling ourselves and submitting ourselves and being Christ-like is not wrong. I don't care what the world tells us. Because when we do that, we're emulating Jesus. Today, Paul is going to discuss marital relationships. He's talked about expectations of a Christian. He's told us that everything in our marriage needs to be holy because it's between a man and a woman. He laid all that out in verse 5 when you read it. And now he gets into the marital responsibilities. And before we get into these scriptures, let me just ask you a question that used to be universally accepted uh, are, are universally agreed upon the answer, and now it's not. And let me just ask you this as you sit there. Are men and women different? Are men and women different? But the whole world is fighting against that today, right? Matter of fact, men and women aren't different, or you can be fluid in your gender, we're being told. Men and women are different. Why is that? Because God created men and women in a diff different way. We have different desires, we have different wants, we have different needs. That is God's purpose in our life. And anybody that tries to take that away is fighting what God has ordained as holy. Anybody that's taking that away is probably pointing to something as good from verse 5 of chapter 3 of Colossians when they should be looking at verse 12 to see how they live their life. What people call love right now in some circumstances is actually a sin according to God's word. That doesn't mean we're supposed to hate people because we're sinners as well. We're supposed to love them and care for them, but we can't stop preaching the truth of God. It's our responsibility as a church. It's our responsibility as First Baptist Church. So if men and women are different then I want you to remember that as we move into some hotly discussed and debated scriptures in Christianity. And the problem is, is that when we look at these scriptures, sometimes we look at it with a worldview instead of a biblical view. Remembering that men and women are different. Remembering that God has a plan for all of us. I do think it's important to say because I think Christianity is under attack right now in numerous ways. And one of the heresies that we hear is that Christianity is misogynistic and different things. Let me just remind you that it was Jesus who 
took women out of being property and put them on the same level as heirs to the grace of God. That it was Jesus who died for all people. It was Jesus who said we're all equal heirs. It was this radical Jesus that, that interacted with women. It was this radical Jesus that has brought just so much prosperity and happiness to the lives of women across this world that have benefited because of Jesus's death on the cross and now that's being attacked. Mark 10, verse 6, Jesus says this. From the beginning, God made them male and female, made us different. Therefore, a man shall leave his wife and mother and hold fast to his wife. And the two shall become one flesh, so they are no longer two, but one flesh. What a wonderful statement that is. I want you to think about, as we read that, it talks about two will become one, and I never understood it, and I got married, and the longer I've been married now, 32 years, I understand that relationship. I understand what the Scripture's saying there. It's, it's, it's difficult for me to think of life in any other way. And the other thing I'll say it's difficult, as you read the Scriptures, you have to take the totality of Scriptures. If you're united as one, both of you have responsibilities as one, but it's hard for one person to be superior over another when you're united as one, when you're united as one flesh. God has an orderly world, those for men and those for women. And I will tell you, being married to Carol for 32 years, what a blessing it is that she has different motivations as a woman than I have as a man and how it works together and we can move through life. And if you don't understand this union between man and life as one, talk to some of our older saints here in the sanctuary that has lost a spouse and how difficult that is and pray for them because they've lost part of their themselves. God blesses us richly, and then because of sin, we have to die. But Jesus even healed that broken relationship when he was on the cross because we'll have eternity with him. Marriage is the foundation of our country, and marriage is the foundation of our Christian lives. Let's go ahead and jump into Colossians uh, 3, verse 18, where it talks about relationships. This is the verse that gets people angry. And by the way, uh, let's wait because men, we're going to talk a lot more about your responsibilities here in a minute. Sometimes we ignore those responsibilities. Verse 18, wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Now, we get upset with submit because we are Americans and we're individual ruggedness. We don't like that term, but it's in the scripture for a reason. You're united as one, it says submit. Let me give you some other words that could be placed in this place. It'll say defer, consent, offer, help, respect. There's a lot of different words that could be here. And people use this as a way to attack Christianity. But in 1 Peter 3, he talks about uh, wives being subject to your husbands. Why is that the case? Because if they're not a Christian, you can win them over to the cause of Christ because of this action. That's one of the reasons. The other reason I think that's implied here is that in my life, there have been times that my wife has been supportive and been respectful at times, and because of her conduct, because of her Christian conduct, I had to reassess where I was, and she was able to lead me back to where I needed to be because I had a godly wife. Why? Because we're working in this in partnership. That's important. See, here's the reality. If men and women are different, men need this from their wives. Men need wives that respect them and support them and help them because we're different. That's what this verse is getting to. I need, when I'm going through rough times in my life, I'm wired differently than my wife. Things make me angry. That doesn't make my wife angry or she looks at it a different way. And she controls my conduct by the way she handles me because I'm different than her as a man. But God has rules for men as too, men as well. And it says this in verse 19, husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Do not be harsh with them in words. Do not be harsh with them in deeds. That is your responsibility. In 
Ephesians 5.25, it tells us to love your wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for the church. If guys need that support from their wives, wives need to know that you, gentlemen, love them so much that you will give your life for them. That they're more important than anything in your life. Yeah, as many of you know, I was uh, in law enforcement for years, and as a young police officer, I would make runs, and I would see men that had been, and most abusers are men, by far, by far, 90 plus percent. And I would go to these runs, and there's more than you'd ever dream of in a city. And I would go to these runs, and there was this guy that was being overbearing with words, being overbearing physically with someone, and you know what the wife would always tell me that was trying to hold on to this relationship? All I ever wanted was for him to love me. Why? Because men and women are different. All I ever wanted is for him to just love me. Men, your responsibility is love your wife so much there's nobody else in the world more important than your life. 1 Peter 3, verse 7 says, Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel. That is talking about physical strength. Since they are heirs with you to the grace of life so that your prayers may not be handled. Husbands, live with your wives. Die for them. Remember, they are equal in the sight of God and salvation to you. Do not treat them as inferior. Do not treat them harshly because if you do, God says, I'm not going to listen to your prayers. That's significant. Because why would you want to attack your wife when she's part of you, when you're one flesh? See, God has a wonderful plan for our life. Men and women both have special godly purposes in life. Once again, husbands, love your wives more than anything in your life. Love her that way, which means you will love her, you will die for her, and you will emulate Jesus in the way you conduct your lives. Wives, respect your husbands because God respected us and loved us so much that he submitted to death for us. And as one, if you think about it in this way and not as the world denotes it, if men and women are doing what we've been told to do, men and women together as one are emulating the entire life of Jesus Christ. They're serving, they're submitting, they're respecting, they're loving even to the point of death as one together in Christ. That's what they're doing. That's what Paul is calling us to do as individuals and Christians. Do not let the world pollute what God has made holy. Don't let heresy creep into relationships. Understand the totality of what God has done for us and the roles he's given us to work in unison. And when we work in unison, guess what happens? Other people are attracted to the kingdom and Christ is edified through our actions, working as one, men and women. What a wonderful God we serve. Then the rest of chapter 3, Paul gives guidance to children. He gives guidance to fathers. He gives guidance to bond servants and servants at the time. Uh, some were slaves because of being conquered. Some were slaves because of debt. It's different than some of the ways we think of slavery today. Some ways it's similar. Some ways it's different. But he gives guidance to them. And the guidance sometimes is attacked, but the guidance is to show the love of Jesus Christ in those lives. And then he ends in verses 23 through 25. He says this, and this is extremely important in our relationships as husband and wife and our relationships as a church with people outside the church. Whatever you do, verse 23, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ, for the wrongdoer will be paid back for the wrong he has done. There is no partiality. Live your life according to the scriptures of God. Whatever you do, do it with uh, exuberance and the power that comes from the name of Jesus that we studied last week. 
That's how we're supposed to live our life. We're supposed to live our life with the cross before us, focused on that. When our feet hit the floor in the morning, are we focused on things of God? Are we focused on other things? Because I'll submit to you, when we're focused on other things, we are getting to the point that that may be an idol in our life that's coming before God. I'm running a little short on time, so let me get to chapter 4. Here's some further instructions for those of us who accepted Jesus Christ. Continue steadfastly in prayer. Be watchful in it with thanksgiving. You know, prayer, we should always be looking for those opportunities to serve God. We should always be giving God thankfulness. And, And that's hard sometimes. When things are going well, sometimes we forget to give thankfulness to God. When things are going well, we should thank God for the blessings he's given us, for all that he's done for us. And when things are going bad, when things are going poorly, we should thank God, as James says, for finding us worthy to go through through that and show the love of Christ, even when things are tough. And I'll tell you today, maybe the reason we're studying Colossians, and this is speculation, is God is really calling us on that day we all came down and said, we're willing to stand in the gap for Christianity today when it's being under attack. And when you're ready to do that, you have to live your life according to the Christian, and you've got to find joy even when the world's going in a different direction, even when the world is criticizing you, because that's what God has called us to do. Verse 5, walk in wisdom towards outsiders, making the best use of the time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. Here's what I would say. Sometimes we get so angry, and it's easy to get angry with all the things going on in the world today. We get angry and we lash out at those that are lashing out towards us. And as a Christian, we're supposed to be pleasant in many ways. We can be direct in many ways because our words are going to be seasoned by salt. People would be upset with things that I've said today, but listen to how we're saying it. We're saying it out of love and out of what this is, what the Bible says. This is what God has called us to do. But when you're living your life outside of what it says in chapter 3, verse 5, you, people can be defensive. They will attack you. Your responsibility is to love them anyway because Christ loved you first. Love them anyway Season your conversation with salt, meaning don't step away from what God has called you to say. Don't step away from your responsibilities as a Christian. Don't step away from the Word of God. You can share the Word of God, but you can do it in love. You can do it in peace. And they may be upset. They may try to attack you. But guess what? When you go through that, guess what? You're just getting a little bit of the taste of what Jesus went through and you're calling yourself a Christian, you have to be willing to go through it. And when you go through it, you can leave rejoicing knowing that God found you worthy to be that Christian. Remember what Romans told us, that our suffering, if we endure that suffering, suffering leads to endurance. Endurance builds our biblical character. And that character after we've been through that and we've been found worthy gives us that hope Not a nebulous hope, but a hope of certainty for the future, knowing that Jesus is working in our life and he's working away, and one day we will celebrate with him. Our speech and our actions must reflect Jesus. See, from the beginning to the end of Colossians, Anytime Paul brought up some heresy that was being adopted or things that people were talking about, whether they were following the stars or they were following old Jewish tradition, he just kept pointing back to the cross. When you're going through your life and you're going through a difficult time and you don't know what to do, go back to the cross and go back to the Word of God. Go to Jesus for the answers. The Holy Spirit will lead you. God loved us so much that even though we're sinners, He sent His Son to die for our sins. And because Jesus loved us so much, he agreed to come and die for our sins. And because of that, he submitted to death. He rose again and gave us great power in the name of Jesus because of his resurrection. He gave us a rule book, the Bible to live by, and he gave us the Holy Spirit to lead us. God wants everybody to go to heaven. If you don't go to heaven, it's your own fault because God has made it easy and made it plain. Period. And we can share that gospel whether people accept it or not because it is the truth and they will learn the truth the day that they die. 
Let me, let me close with this. When we don't live our lives with Christ at the forefront, when we don't live our lives abstaining from sinful acts and running towards holiness, it eventually catches up to us. It eventually just catches up to us. It, it, it eventually sin overtakes us and leaves us with no hope, that hope that Paul talked about in Romans. It does have that effect. It's one of the reasons I think we're, we talk about what is the impact for our lives, what is the impact for the church. But something has become very clear to me as I've talked about this for the last few weeks is that I continue to have people come up to me and call me and talk to me and just regular conversations and talk about things that have happened to them in their past and they're having trouble getting over it now. And I'd say you have to give that to Jesus, right? And you have to remember that Jesus can take that incident as horrible as it was and he can use it for you to tell other people how Jesus got you through that situation. Don't let Satan rob you of the promises that God has given you in the, in the word of God. But as a flip side of that, as many people as I've talked to that's brought up stuff in the past that's harmed them, as I shared some of the past Christian leaders that Kara and I have said under their teaching and how they sinned and how that could adversely affect us, instead of focusing on them or losing faith, I kept looking to the cross and we kept moving forward. But as terrible as it can be on your own life for not following God, I've seen some people say, well, you know what? It's my life. It only affects me. I'll do what I want. That's nonsense. Because you know who else it affects? It affects your family. It affects your friends. It affects those people that you're working with because they see you as a Christian. And when you falter, it has a negative effect that can last for generations. That's the sadness that comes with not serving God. And God loved us so much that he sent his son to protect us from that. But yet we still, we still, as hard as it is, we dwell on these things and it harms, and that's what's going on in the church today. People are not living up to that calling of Christian. They're living their life more in line with verse 5 of chapter 3 than verse 12. And it's negatively affecting their life, and it's affecting their family and friend's life, because guess what? You're not fooling anybody. And I say that once again, trying to say it as lovingly as I can, seasoned with salt, but the reality is the reality because in my life, as I've talked to people, as I've counseled with people, they talk about things that happened decades ago that's still adversely affecting their life. I've made a living as a police officer. Robin's made a living in the sheriff's department. We have other people associated with this church in policing, and you make a living on making runs with people dealing with issues that happened decades ago when Christ can take all that away. Christ can take all of that away. Kara and I, when I first really became aware of this, I was a young person. Kara and I were married, we just bought a home and we had some neighbors across the street and the neighbors were in their 80s, been married for 50, 60 years, wonderful, wonderful couple. And what I didn't understand, cause once again, I saw how two become one, they work together to get through life together and the husband had some medical issues, but the wife was there supporting, taking care of him. And I didn't realize this, but was making sure he had his pills the right way and he was functioning fine. When she ended up getting sick, he fell apart. He didn't know which way to go. He was having trouble. But right before, as she was getting sick and he was worried about losing her, she would call me over him and talk to me and, and we would have conversations. And this gentleman who is in his late 80s at the time is having nightmares about something that happened to him when he was 12 years of age because his mother did not live up to that Christian mother that she was supposed to be. As a matter of fact, had treated him so poorly as a kid, they had to move three or four times in their life to get away from the small town talk because mom had an issue and mom never dealt with it. And here her son is. 70 plus years after, still dealing with it all that time. Had dealt with it his entire life as I was talking to him. What a horrible way to go through your life. And it could have been stopped by a mom running towards Jesus instead of sin. And it could have been stopped if our friend Russ would have just given it all to Christ. As hard as that is. As difficult as that is. 
and let God just do what God does in our lives. Don't let what happened to you in the past define where you're going in the future. Don't, because that's from Satan. With all that Paul has talked to us, talked to us about, taught us, I think it can be summed up pretty easily. With all the, the heresy that we're dealing with in our churches today, in our country today, I think Paul's words sum it up pretty, pretty well, but I think we can even sum it up and make it even easier. For those of us who have been in church, for those of us that are Christians, here's what I think Paul's telling us. Stop it. Stop it. You have a purpose, and that purpose is to follow what Christ did on the cross for you. Amen? I'm going to ask the deacons and their wives to come forward. I don't know where you are in life, and one of the things that we do here at our church, the new tradition we started uh, last year, is that we have our deacons and wives forward to pray for people. Why? Because the Bible tells us to pray for people. It tells us to anoint with oil if people want to be anointed with oil. We'll hear about that, by the way, as we study the kings of Israel and anointing them with oil. There's something powerful about that, and that's still part of it today. If you'd ever want that, our deacons are prepared to pray for you and their wives as well. But we, we offer people here to pray for any type of issue. It can be a health issue. We've had that. We've had people come for salvation. They'll pray for that. It can be that you just want to come and just rededicate yourself to Christ. Maybe you want to come and say, you know what? I just want to give God all the glory for what he's done in my life and how he's got me through it. That's why we come together as a church. Confess our sins to one another, pray for one another, love one another, and support one another. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the book of Colossians. Thank you for Paul and his masterful words, Lord, that are inspired by you. We thank you for all the blessings you've given us as individuals. We thank you for the blessing of marriage, Lord, how two souls can come together into one. And, and it's like faith, Lord. Sometimes we don't fully understand it, but we know it because we see it. And we see the love that you have for us so much that you've given us a spouse to help us in this life, to guide us in this life, Heavenly Father. We thank you for the love that you have given us. Let us be found worthy. Let us be found worthy to be called a Christian. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Those of you that are up here praying, just continue to pray. Church, let us come together as a congregation to end this morning. Father, we thank you so much for the love of Jesus Christ. We thank you for your Holy Spirit, the great comforter that is in us, that is with us, that whispers to us and tells us what to do in circumstances and how to deal with those things. There's so many times that we focus on the community, we focus on the other side of the world, we focus on our neighbors. And today we've learned, Lord, that we should continue to love and focus on our families, on our spouses, to pay attention to them to make sure that they feel the love and that that love that is flowing out of us is from Jesus, that our children and grandchildren will be able to witness this and take that to their spouses. And we can continue with the family that you have put together, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.